I think we'll go ahead and get started. I hope everyone has some good weather and a good lunch in front of them. Thank you all for joining us for a session on account-based marketing for manufacturers. Before we jump into the introductions, I want to take a moment to talk about why the marketing world is buzzing about ABM or account-based marketing. And there's a few reasons I think this approach of account-based marketing has really started to get talked about a lot. One of those main reasons is economic trends. We've been thinking we're in a recession or about to be in a recession for about the past year or 18 months. And as a result, all of us are a little hesitant to spend big money, both as customers and as marketers. Account-based marketing addresses that by being a more strategic, tailored approach that both provides more value to the consumer, so they're more likely to buy, and lowers the chances of marketing waste because it is so direct and intentional. So marketers and salespeople like it for that reason as well. It's a way to direct your dollars that's very tangible. The other primary reason, and I think this one is perhaps more critical because it is more enduring, is that B2B is finally recognizing that there has been a seismic shift in buyer behavior that's only going to get more prominent. We saw the same shift happen years ago in the B2C world. Think about how the car buying process has evolved. No one just goes to a used car lot anymore and strikes up a conversation with the dealer. You just don't do that. It's an entirely different process. Today's consumers, professionally and personally, don't reach out to the salespeople at the beginning of the funnel, at the beginning of their buyer journey. They do their own research. They do their own learning on their own at the beginning of their buyer journey. They'll try to compare things on their own. They'll try to educate themselves as much as possible for as long of their journey as they can until they're at the very end of the funnel and need to make a choice. And then they will talk to a salesperson. This is a big shift in how prospects interact with salespeople. And it means that marketing and sales need to be much more aligned and integrated than ever before. If you're still thinking, hey, my customers, they don't really read my reviews. They only look at my website. That doesn't really matter. My customers, it's all about relationships. There's a time limit on how long that is true. And ABM is the approach that you're going to need to pivot to. So with that understanding of why this is so critical, let's go ahead and go into introductions. So. Oh. I'm Erin. You can see that right here. I have 18 years of digital and web experience, and I've worn just about every hat at data at this point. I've worked across scores of client accounts in a variety of roles, anything from strategist to like obscure tech help of how do we hook this up to this and make it do this to actual brand and website design. So I've been across the board. My role today is to really help data anticipate and innovate around industry trends shakeups with new tech. So AI is a big part of my job right now. Develop new services in tandem with Laura. And I spend a little bit of trying to convince everyone that augmented reality totally going to be a thing any minute now. been saying that for about two years. Laura, you want to introduce yourself? Yeah, thanks, Aaron. I'm Laura Kruger. I am a data's chief operating officer. I've got more years of experience than I want to talk about in advertising and helping businesses grow. At Data, I own the client experience, and I really work strategically with account managers on key accounts to develop growth opportunities and make sure that we're continuously improving our ability to meet the needs of our clients and their all of their ever-changing goals. And I am reluctantly a process person. So with that, let's dive into ABM. ABM, in a nutshell, is it treats marketing and sales like a flip side of kind of the same coin. So it focuses on the account level and it recognizes the value in those long-term relationships instead of the really short-term wins. Uh, instead of deploying a very like widespread advertising approach to a broad audience, an ABM strategy is going to concentrate your resources on a targeted group of really pivotal accounts that you're going to see move the needle for your business. Um, then it's a matter of building those relationships and staying in front of them until you figure out how to land them, but it doesn't stop there. Then you really need to retain those accounts. You need to grow the accounts and turn them into advocates for your business. And account-based marketing, strictly speaking, isn't new. It just has a sexy new acronym because we're marketers and that's our game. Some of you are probably already doing pieces or potentially all of what we're going to discuss today and may just not have titled it as such. 
It's a very common sense approach to marketing big ticket B2B purchases. And what's a big ticket B2B purchase? What kind of, what qualifies that to be really good for ABM? If your buyers are a small segment of the population, if you look at the population and most of the population is not qualified to buy, has no need for your offerings, may not even know your offerings exist, and you have a very niche target that you're going after, that's one sign that ABM is likely going to be better for you than a traditional marketing play. The other factor to look at is your product or service that you're attempting to sell. Your traditional kind of mass market spray and pray with a big awareness campaign that filters into nurturing and then to closing. This is a better play for marketers who are dealing with very transactional purchases where it can be very guided by the customer. If your purchase or your product or service requires a lot of configuration, a lot of discovery, a lot of trust building along the way, and especially if it's a group buying decision instead of an individual buying decision, account-based marketing is likely going to be a better approach for you because it's more customized and more individualized to the consumer. It allows for that growth of trust. It actually builds it into the process. So here we're comparing the two. This is what most marketers get taught in college or if you've taken HubSpot's courses. A lot of it is this funnel view the standard in education and frankly, where most of the attention has gone thus far in digital marketing. Lots of spend and brand awareness, low outbound sales, a lot of automation, transactional closes. ABM is the opposite. First, it starts by narrowing the targeting to only the right customers, not all possible customers out there, just the right ones. Then it grows the potential for a small list of accounts and you start to engage with them. And then the goal is that you land, you get a foothold in a company, and then you have actual growth plans for each of your customers on how you're going to expand your services with them and increase your partnership. So these are the steps we'll break down a bit more today. And we'll start with kind of what makes a right customer. But before we jump into that, Laura has an example for us of what this actually looks like in action with a real world case study. Well, let's talk about backing up a minute and starting with your high level business objectives. Um, I work with this client and they have several product lines and services. They're selling to a variety of different customers with their complex business. They really had to break down their revenue goals into different categories for each segment of their business. And they had to do that in order to prioritize their efforts because they can't do it all at once. So they divided their revenue goals into four buckets. Um, They looked at current client growth, which I was really happy that they didn't ignore because it gets ignored. They looked at new market expansion. They looked at new logos, which you commonly see as a goal. And they looked at retention. Once they reviewed each of these product goals and put them in these quadrants, then they could prioritize. And in this case, they prioritized their new market expansion, as well as diversifying their customer base. And the goals that fell into the new market expansion were really perfect candidates for an ABM strategy. In this example, instead of identifying lists of their ideal customers, they hand-selected five major retailers as their target market, and they actually developed a unique plan for each one of these. Every single player knew exactly what their role was and what role they played in this plan from marketing to sales to operations. And now with that example, let's hop into the steps that we can take to identify who your target customers are. So account-based marketing, like it says on the box, is account-focused, aka individual customer-focused. So when Laura talks about a list of five customers, that is account-based marketing. Those are the five accounts you're targeting. So before we dive more into the what and how, we have to talk about the who. Yeah, and the first step to understanding the what customers and what accounts are your best fit is really taking a look at your business. So most businesses get their start without really having a tight target market or a target customer identified. And they take the work that kind of comes in and they expand their services or products based on what the customer's needs are. And it happens organically. But there's eventually a place in a business where you reach a scale and you really need to become more efficient so you can grow profitably. And that usually comes along with this idea of narrowing down your focus on what you do really well and who you do that best with. 
So your customers have to look alike in some ways. There's got to be some groupings. Otherwise, you have to have very few customers and charge a lot. So your ideal customer profile should be based in reality of who your best match is today, but you should also make sure that it's grounded in facts. What that should look like is, and it can be as simple as a bulleted list, and ideally it would be full of attributes that you can find data on. And there's going to be a layer of the soft stuff like psychographics and needs and motivations. But what I would do first is start with your current customer list. You could export the list from your CRM and then start narrowing down on your top customers. And we know that profit's going to be the easiest indicator, but you've got to remember that it's not the only one. If it's a profitable customer, but maybe they're only buying a single product line, they're probably not an ideal customer. And then the second thing to remember here too is make it a team exercise. These strategies cannot be accomplished successfully on their own. So the best way to make it work is really to put these strategies together with all the players in the room so they get on board and understand the plan. One side note I'll mention too is while you're categorizing your customer list, just make sure that your notes are in the mindset that at any point a customer could see those notes someday. So you just want to protect yourself a little bit, make sure that you're being professional in your notes. And then most people, like I mentioned, would start with their CRM data for this process, but you might be sitting here wondering, okay, is my CRM going to get me what I need? Um, and Aaron can dive into that a little bit more here next. All right. So I'm going to launch a poll here on CRM adoption. Just see where everyone likes. So go ahead, enter the poll. And then we'll talk a little bit about what we're looking for in a CRM. Okay. I'm seeing most people are pretty much exactly where I would expect that you have a CRM, you're using a CRM but maybe you feel like you're not getting everything out of the CRM that you could. And that's a mindset I see a lot as people are working to adopt technology. So I'll go ahead and end that poll and share the results. Everyone I've never should... had anybody say that they are at the state where other people ask them for CRM advice. I was hoping. Yeah, no, I put that in there. And if anyone answers it, we'll grab <laughs> them. <laughs> we'll have them present this next if they answer that question. All right quick PSA on CRMs. They don't need to look like the stock photo here. Pretty sure that's not what Salesforce looks like. But CRMs, customer relationship management tools, do need to exist. You should be running off of one today. You should not still be running off of spreadsheets. And they need to have useful data in them. And what useful data means is going to vary by organization. Ideally, your CRM integrates with the rest of your tech stack. So your ERP, your accounting software, for us, it's really important that it integrates with our project management and quoting software. What we're seeing as an industry trend across multiple industries, not just manufacturing, is that suites like Udo or for us, we use Excello. These full option suites are becoming more and more popular for smaller and smaller organizations because we all want to be digitally integrated. So if you're sitting there at the, we have a CRM, we're not really sure if we're using it to its full capabilities. We don't feel like enough of our systems talk to each other. We feel like we're falling behind. Uh, you're probably not falling behind. From what I've heard, you're right in the middle of the pack where we all are trying to figure out how do we get our systems to work together well. But with a CRM, the starting point is really focusing on the basic demographic and financial information you can capture. This is stuff you want to have on every business you're working with. You want to understand their size, you want to understand their industry, even getting down to their SIC or NAICS codes if you can. Uh, you want their address so you can send them mail, uh, basic things like that. And from there, establish a basic footprint that you can be consistent with and then build on it gradually and incrementally. Don't try to bite off a giant project to profile other, every customer with 50 custom fields right off the bat because it won't work. What I do tend to see people fall into is a little bit of a trap with CRM world is that they go a little custom field crazy. You need to be realistic about your organizational discipline. Just because you would be nice to know that information about the customer, what can happen is you build out the custom field, you're all excited about it, you fill in three customers with that custom field information, and then you come back a year later and those three customers are still the only ones with that field filled out, which makes it essentially worthless. So Sometimes less is more, and as you're tiptoeing into really optimizing your CRM usage, uh, aim for consistency over 
length of content or comprehension. So that's just our little how you should use your CRM for your ABM work. So now that you've followed Laura's steps, you've exported a list from your CRM, you've narrowed it into the top customers that are great and don't make anyone cry, then we want to start to look across that group and find similarities between them and correlations across them. These could be really straightforward. It could be something like firmographics. Do larger companies tend to be easier to work with? Do customers from the aviation segment seem to close faster than in the medical device world? Or it could be fluffier, less straightforward tendencies, like we do better with slightly laid back culturally companies, or we do better with companies that are really growth focused. We don't do better with companies that are happy with the status quo because they won't work with us to get to that next level. And that's really where we shine. So you need to kind of be building your list of attributes that you want, that you see is unifying those customers that are your ideals. The other thing to balance when you're looking at this list of existing customers is what's their need like? How valuable to them are you? If you had to close up shop tomorrow, who would be devastated and who would be like, oh, that sucks. I guess I'll go with the next guy. That's an important thing to measure when it comes to your best customers. So this final list of ideal customers is the starting basis for your account part of account-based marketing. So you take that list that now you found some correlations, some similarities across, and you start figuring out what are these things that I identified can be used to find new customers that are likely to behave like these star customers. There's going to be some judgmental balance that you need to add to this as well. So to further focus, you might decide, hey, even though my best customers are in this industry, I think economically that industry is going to see some hurdles in the next few years. So let's focus on customers in this other industry that are still great for us, but don't make up as much of our mix now. You also want to keep in mind diversity of revenue. You don't want to put all your eggs in one basket, no matter how shiny that basket is. You do want to be thinking of multiple buckets of customers. So that's just fine. Not all customers fit into one profile. You can have a few different buckets. The number of buckets need to be proportional to your size and ability to serve them. So this is about fitting people into slots to some extent you can't be so individualized that you can't do any pattern identification. So if you have 10 customers and 10 buckets, you're probably doing it wrong. Go back to the drawing board, work a little harder on identifying what really sets those customers apart and what unifies them. So as an example in the yellow outline here, this is our ideal customer profile at data. It's a work in progress. All of these should be. They're not a static thing that you set and forget. But we know that if a company fits these criteria, they're likely to be happy with us. And we're likely to be able to really help them. At that revenue and employee count, we're a very competitive alternative to an internal hire or to other outsourcing solutions. The services that we're best at are a best fit for organizations that sell a high value product to a fairly specific audience like this ICP would. And for us, we can look at the data of our own customers and how that's performing. And we can say, yep, this is true. We know that for a fact that this Customer profile works well for us because we have the proof of doing good work for them and of their satisfaction with us. So now in chat, I'd like people to just go ahead and throw out some of the traits that signal your ideal customer as you understand them today. This doesn't have to be anything scientifically backed at this point, but what are some of those things that you suspect make an ideal customer for you? All right. Laura. All right. So now moving on, once you have your ideal customer identified, it's time to go get that new business, right? Not entirely. That exercise that we just talked about that you've now gone through is super valuable for your existing customer base. And you should really know now where you should focus. So your current list of ideal customers should really serve as your guide for where to focus your inside sales and your customer service efforts. For each of them, you should have a plan on how to grow that account and hold your account managers to it. They probably already have it. They have ideas, but make sure that you're also utilizing your CRM for your existing account growth. 
Um, you're also going to have some goal for new logos as well. And you've got to find a balance between growing your existing accounts, the efforts that go there and what you're going to do for new business. That balance is really going to look different for every business. It's going to be unique. We typically look at attrition rate versus growth rate for your existing customers and then compare it to the growth for new customers. And then you'll set specific goals that are going to really trickle down from your revenue growth goals. And that'll help you balance that. Ultimately, it's just really critical to remember that account-based marketing means marketing to both your existing and your potential customers. Let's talk about finding the new business now that I put in my two cents about remembering your existing customers. All right. And you may find that it makes more sense to focus on existing customers than it does to focus on finding new customers. That can be an economic thing, but there is data out there that basically suggests the fastest, easiest revenue is to farm existing customer bases, which we'll have a follow-up webinar on versus going out and pursuing new logos. But if you are going to pursue new logos, because that's fun, this is how you would start creating that list of target new accounts. And this should be arrived at in a couple different ways. Probably the simplest is the friend of friends way. This tends to be your low hanging fruit on the new logo acquisition stage. So this looks like referrals from current customers, referrals from employees, this looks like they're in the member, they're in the same association or professional groups that you are, or it could be community relationships where you're just connected within the community. People know you, maybe you're on nonprofit boards, people understand what they do, and they might pull you into conversations. So you have a broad network out there. The trick is figuring out how to harness and farm it, right? One of the most straightforward ones is to have formal, intentionally maintained relationships with organizations who are connected to companies within your ICP. So this could look like trade associations. This could look like professional membership groups. For us, for example, Enterprise Minnesota is a really key partner for us. They have been instrumental in getting us some really great introductions to clients of theirs that they believe could benefit from knowing us. One word here, there's a lot of associations out there. <clears throat> you need to prioritize quality over quantity. Some associations you'll find, you'll join, or maybe you'll attend a few meetings. And if you threw a rock, you'd hit a competitor before you hit a customer. So look for the ones where they're not just full of insurance people and bankers. Look for the ones where there's actual meat and value being given to the member base of the industry that you're trying to serve. In addition to formal and intentional relationships, you also want a way to informally encourage relationships. So you want a process for identifying potential referrals and for asking for referrals. What we see is that most customers tell us, oh, I get most of my business from my existing customers. And then we say, oh, do you have a referral process? Like, no, that would be a good idea. Yes, it would be. Most of your happy customers are happy to introduce others to you, but it's not top of mind for them because it's not their business. You need to make the ask and that ask will make them feel valued. So have a process for identifying, hey, so-and-so is connected to so-and-so who could also be a great customer for us. Let's ask them for an introduction. Let's ask them if they know them well enough to make that happen for us. And we have found that it really does help to have a target in mind. So not just asking your customer, hey, you got any friends? But asking them, hey, I saw on LinkedIn that you're connected to Dan over at XYZ Industries. Do you know him well? I think we'd be a great fit for him. Could you make an introduction? That's a much stronger ask than an open-ended one that requires more thought from your customer. It's also just more polite because it saves them time. And when there isn't this formal relationship process going on, don't forget to make a meaningful thank you in the case of a customer referring someone, or especially in the case of employees thanking some, referring someone, make sure that there's a thank you that's personal, that means something to them. And in the case of employees, especially make sure it's recognized at the company level, because that's really awesome. If you get that happening, you want to encourage and reward that behavior. All right. So that's the low hanging fruit is friends of friends. The harder one, but Honestly, the slightly more efficient, easy to process one is research-based. 
So this is where you're going out and sourcing lists using something like Zoom Info or LinkedIn Sales Navigator. And I'll show you both of those on the next slide here. We are able to generate lists with these platforms, and then you're able to export them, append them, prioritize them, tweak that data, and overlay it with others. So much like with your CRM, where you exported a list of existing customers with a tool like Zoom Info, you'll be able to export a list in some format and from here overlay other data. So let's say you're a member of an organization that shares its member list. You could overlay that data with the ICP data you got from Zoom Info and have a combined list that shows you maybe who on the big list of all the potential prospects could you get an easy end with because you belong to the same membership group. That's one example. Oftentimes with doing research-based identification, you are starting at the local level. You're identifying the company prospect. From there, one of the kind of more art than science portions of it is identifying the people or person that can open doors for you. So it's often two layers of lists and research here. But I will go ahead and dive into both of these. So one sec while I open them up. So we'll start with and I'll start with Zoom Info, actually. Zoom Info, there's a lot of competing solutions out there like Zoom Info. Full interest and in being candid, we've actually switched over to a platform called Sales Intel, which has a lot of the same functionality, but just a hair cheaper. Zoom Info tends to be the gorilla in the room in terms of capabilities, but they are a little pricier and there's some gotchas in their agreement terms that you do need to be careful of. But they're really awesome for searching and identifying clients. So I can start at the company level or I can start at the contact level. Generally, what I see with B2B is that you're usually starting potentially with industry. In this case, let's say, let's say water treatment. Maybe we manufacture something for water treatment manufacturers. You'll notice up here, the view has contacts and companies. Let's start with the company level. From there, we can narrow it down based on financials. And we're just narrowing further you can see up here, the tags start to pop up. We only want B2B, for example, and let's say we only want public, or we could say, hey, we only work with the government. We love RFPs, those are our favorite. From there, now that we have our list of 10 companies, now let's make them US-based, let's narrow it down further. So we can do US, we can narrow it by state, you can, you can get down to the zip code level with this. So there's two. And out of those two companies, there's 93 contacts. So that's when we would start to filter things down by the contact level. And we'd be looking at who's C-level, et cetera, things like that. Now, what this will get us is we can export it to Excel. And from there, we can tweak it a little further. We can overlay things. And we can actually import that into our CRM and start working to sell them and get in contact with them. We can also use this list as a foundation for a bunch of other marketing tactics that help with ABM. So that is Zoom Info, Sales Intel, a couple others all work the same way. One to look at also would be Growbot. They do both the contact lookup and actual email automation work. So that's an interesting combo for you. The other one which is really useful for individual salespeople particularly, is Sales Navigator. So this is more about understanding connections within your network and finding ways to get into conversation with people who might be on your greater list. So same deal here, we have account-based level, which would be the company versus lead-based, which would be the individual. And a lot of similar things where we can choose the revenue, headcount, industry, but where it gets interesting is more on the lead level where we can see connections. So we can see who is in my first degree connections. We can see second degree connections, which means that they know someone that I am already connected with. So there's potential for me to ask for that referral. And then we have team link connections, which is where I can invite members of my team to an unpaid seat that gives me access to search their network with Sales Navigator. So if, for instance, maybe I've got a board that's very involved in our industry, I could add them to team link seats and from there see their contacts and ask them for introductions to people that we've identified as being in our target customer range. That works really well. The other thing you can do is actually upload a list. So I could create a list in Zoom Info, upload it to Sales Navigator, and use that to figure out who am I connected to already through a second or third degree connection 
within that list. And I can use that as a way to prioritize my plan of attack. I will note though, with LinkedIn Sales Navigator, there is no simple export functionality. You can find third-party plugins to help you export, but that is not always the safest approach. It can be against LinkedIn's terms of service. So lots of tools out there to go find new prospects with. And drop in the chat if you have any experience with this already. That would be interesting to hear. All right, so that covered the account portion of account-based marketing. Now let's talk about the marketing portion. The marketing portion doesn't require crazy new tactics. You might actually find yourself going a little old school. And Laura is going to get us kicked off by discussing the different levels that fall into account-based marketing and how that can influence your choice of tactics. Thanks, Erin. Yep. So now we have the who we want to talk to. And now we're going to go into the what do we want to do? How do we want to get in front of them? And although it's the marketing portion of account-based marketing, it's not just marketing, it's heavy sales involvement too. So you'll notice that as we're walking through. Your marketing efforts should really be directed at a targeted list of accounts at this point, or they're going to be based on your ideal customer profile. But these efforts are going to look different based on the customer prioritization level that you see here in front of you right now. So there's three different kind of flavors of the account-based marketing buckets. And these are going to be based around how custom your approach is going to be based off of the individual accounts. The first one here is the strategic account-based marketing. And this top tier, this is one-to-one. -one. At Data, I manage these programs with a few of our top accounts. I work directly with the key customers and I really determine how we can add more value over time to them. It's a long-term strategic approach and it's very individualized to their organization. It's custom entirely to them. The second tier is what we call ABM Lite. And these are more programs and marketing communications or campaigns that are going to be directed at those small clusters of organizations where we talked about some that have similarities to each other. It could be as simple as identifying which existing customers are a good fit for maybe a new product line to expand services to, and then targeting them with a catered campaign using what we know about their similarities to customize an approach at a broader level. Uh, and then lastly, we have the programmatic ABM level. And this is really what is enabled by that list building power of the databases that Aaron covered, like Zoom Info and Sales Intel. This is the ability to amass a really large list of likely ideal customers. Of course, the downside to this is with the scale, you lose that individualization. You might be targeting like 1,500 known name businesses on LinkedIn Navigator and InMail, but it's going to be more templated than you would do at that strategic ABM level where you know their business and their motivations inside and out. And customers really should work their way up through these levels as you build the relationship. I'm going to talk through an example of that next with one of our existing accounts that I get to work with. So I work with an account called Spectrum Aeromed, and it's a manufacturing business. They're in the air medical space, and they had a new product launch that involved account-based marketing as a significant part of their go-to-market strategy. One of the critical parts of their strategy was really aligning sales and ops so their engineers could be working ahead of sales versus trying to catch up with whatever deals the sales team landed. The reason for this is the fact that their products actually require FAA approval, and it's a super long process to get FAA approval. So you don't want your sales team out selling something where you're not going to get your STC for three years because you're going to have some prospects that are going to get excited about a new product and be left waiting. Um, so Spectrum Aeromed went through this process. They first identified their ICP. They did market research. They identified which aircraft and which customers they were going to target. From that, Spectrum used a variety of different resources. It ranged from their own CRM to purchasing lists, and they built out these buckets of targets. Uh, their existing customers that already own Spectrum equipment with that specific family of aircraft that they were going to targeting they were at that first level of ABM that we talked about with strategic ABM. Those were the customers that the sales team already knew. 
They understand their business, their motivations, their decision-making process, and a specific strategy uh, for each one of those accounts was created for that bucket. There weren't a ton of the of customers and uh, contacts in that bucket. Next, their owners of the aircrafts in that family fell into that second bucket, which is ABM Light. In this case, those are really the decision makers or the owners of the aircrafts. And one of the tactics that they did for this group was personalized invites to go to a large trade show that their sales team would be at to try to get personal meetings with these customers. And then we had that last year of the programmatic approach, and this was more of that full list of operators and pilots that have flown that family of aircraft. And they focused on really providing more education around their new product for this group, and it was their attempts to drive them up through that pyramid into that second bucket and get more personalized conversations going. So at this point, after they had all of this mapped out, they kicked off their campaign and they geared it towards their targeted list while sales focused on the trade show plans around their ICP. And in this case, it was super important that operations, sales, and marketing were in sync. And if it hadn't been, and those teams were moving in different directions, it would have been a pretty big disaster. Lots of opportunity to waste a lot of money there. Yep. All right. So at this point, we know who we're targeting, how we're prioritizing those targets, and how our list of targets line up with those ABM levels from programmatic to strategic. Now we need to plan what are we actually going to do? We need to step beyond full funnel. Our marketing efforts actually need to be full circle. So at Data, we use our own loop framework to map out tactics based on what makes sense for each stage of our customer's decision-making process. You're all familiar with the traditional sales funnel, but that model falls short when it comes to marketing your existing accounts, which is a big focus for ABM. We're not going to dive into the details of this six-stage model today because it should be so fairly self-explanatory for what we need right now. But essentially, we can use this framework to split individual tactics out across channels, across campaigns, or in the case we'll talk about today, teams and roles to really get a comprehensive view of our marketing strategy and our customer's experience. So here's a simplified hypothetical example of what that could look like in action. So we've taken our loop, we've taken those six stages, we've put them across the top here. And our second row here is the client row, which is talking about how the client's viewpoint, what their actions are, how that changes throughout their journey as they go from realizing, hey, I need a solution here to actually purchasing it to then telling others how their experience was. So this is what the customer goes through. It's followed by these following roles are the internal roles that support this customer journey. And it's always going to be multiple teams. I don't know a company on earth where there's only one team that interacts with interfaces and supports the customer as they go from awareness to advocacy. In this example, this is very generic, but in reality, the more you understand the, per the particulars of how your customer shops and decides, the more you can cater to their desired experience through the tactics and processes you adopt and how those teams work together. The better job you do with that, the more your customers enjoy working with you, the more they recommend you to others, the more your revenue grows. So this loop is a little bit self-sustaining as well. So these rows really define ownership of the tasks and tactics that go into building a customer journey, a customer experience around making this decision. So this big picture view is really useful in terms of allowing you to spot gaps figure out process flow internally and externally, and it lets you put a why behind a lot of your marketing activity. Marketing waste is something we see a lot of where it builds up over time in organizations where, why do we do this? Because we've always done this. Why? We don't really know how it connects to our goals. We don't know how it meets our customers' needs. We're not sure how it adds values, but we did it the last three years, so we're signing up for that trade show again. An exercise like this lets you spot where you can trim or potentially where there's a gap where you've fallen short. Maybe you're not supporting people post-purchase well enough. And if you fixed that gap with a little bit of marketing, you'd see more advocacy out the other end. 
So really this framework lets you translate strategy into execution. And as Laura is going to cover on the next slide, it's also a helpful way to measure results, which is the really key ending point of any successful ABM campaign is you don't just set it loose in the wild, let it free and do its thing. You measure it. Yeah. Don't spend this much time to get to this point and then just do the things and don't see if the things are working. So it's very important. We see it skipped quite often. And a lot of times it's because people are just looking at their overall growth and you might have overall growth, but you also might be getting that from specific areas and tactics and not from the entire strategy. So it's really important to look at the contributing inputs and metrics and look at the numbers and that you really built your goals around. So what we do is we put it in context of the loop, like Aaron mentioned, so you can see that big picture of how the goals work together and drive the growth. But when you think about your results, you've got to differentiate between those inputs and the results piece. Inputs, those are what Aaron went through. They're the actions that you're doing, the tactics, the effort you put in to generate the results. And you really, you're trying to understand from looking at these results, what effort is the most effective, what's worth it, and what leading indicators do you have for future revenue growth? How far back can you actually track your user journey? This is where we can see optimizations begin. You can review, you can understand what's working, what isn't, what you need to spend more time on. And I can attest to this. I have not seen any successful account-based marketing strategies work if they're not doing this step. It's critical. You have to review the effectiveness of every tactic on that level. All right. We're about at time here with 10 minutes left till one o'clock. So to wrap up today, here's the big things you got to keep in mind if you're pursuing an account-based marketing strategy. These are the bare necessities. So you need to keep the customer at the center of your strategy and individualize to them. You need to think and act like a team for that customer versus thinking and acting like totally separate functions of a business. The customer will feel those silos and it won't feel good. It won't feel like a smooth, integrated customer experience. It'll feel like they're forced to navigate things and things don't make sense to them. So remember, everything you do affects everything you do. And then finally, Try to build processes that are self-improving over time, that evolve to become more efficient, to become more effective because there's inherent feedback loops built in. So this is what's possible when you're acting like a team and communicating about the process at regular intervals. You're able to optimize over time so that this really becomes a lean, repeatable machine that you can run to grow current customers, to find new customers, and to ultimately meet your financial goals with the highest ROI possible from your marketing. Thank you for joining us today. If you already ate lunch, I hope it was a good one. If you're about to eat lunch, I hope you have something tasty in mind. We'll take questions via chat or just raise your hand on the attendee list and we'll answer any questions people have. Otherwise, please reach out if you have questions on our content or want to talk about how you could apply this in your organization today. Uh, we have a full team of consultants that's happy to meet with you, talk about how you could assemble a customer list really meet you where you're at and get you started with a full-fledged ABM strategy. Thank you for joining us.